Well, hello there. Welcome once more to Conchua's Kitchen. And if this is your first time stopping by, I'd like to say a very warm welcome to you. Thanksgiving is around the corner and I'm about to do my table skip. I thought to share with you. So come along and let's do this. I'm starting off by clearing my table. This is the decor that I've had for a while on here just to be in the fall mood. But I'm going to take that off, clean my table so we can start with our actual Thanksgiving table skip. <music> just unrealistic to be buying new tableware every year or every now and then so I like to just play around with what I have so this year instead of using my placemats as placemats I'm going to be using a few of them as a table runner I'm now going to set down my play chargers these are crystal beaded very elegant I think they're pretty gorgeous it matches whatever theme you are trying to do and goes so beautifully with my dinnerware and my flatware so the ones that I had previously I'd had them for like 10 years and they were just a set that completed my uh, grand buffet set and after nine years and a lot of changes in how tables are set these days I got these to make it a little bit more trendy I'm setting down my dinner plates now accent plates is one way for you to also change things out a little bit so I got these plates so that I would not use my traditional salad plates that came with my set so I have switched them around and using these salad plates instead just to bring a little bit of layering a little bit of vibe to my tablescape and I think it really worked well so here are my dinner napkins I got gold because I wanted to have a little bit more gold the napkins to match the accent plate and my charger as well as my flatware. I love to personalize things. So for this year, I'm going to put placeholders. I actually got this uh, after Thanksgiving 2019, hoping to have used it last year, but thanks to COVID, of course, that, that didn't happen. So I'm going to be using it this year and I'm just going to set one on top of my napkins like this. And I'll put a little message for everybody with their name as well. That would be nice, I think. So I actually decided to change how I'm setting my napkins on my table. So I'm going to actually use my napkin rings, but that is another thought that I wanted to put it here for you. So in case you don't have napkin rings or you wanted to do something different, you would do it. But I had these napkin rings that I really wanted to use. These are Martha Stewart and it was on sale in Macy's this year. So I got that for like $10 or so, not bad at all for a set. So my napkin has gold. Uh, embroidery on it so I'm trying to maximize uh, a lot of the gold trying to show more of the gold because those are the accents that go with everything I got it purposefully for the gold so I want more of it to show I'm just trying to fold it you know it's just you're trying to almost like do it in an accordion way and then slide your napkin ring right through it just like this fan it out and you have your little bow. It is pretty. It's a lot of couples coming in here, of course. So we have uh, ladies. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to put a little bit of beauty, more a little bit of feminine. But I think it's nice that the men will also appreciate it. It makes it a little bit more special, I think. And making sure that everything lays perfectly beautiful because if you are taking the time to do this, you might as well make sure that it is perfect. So it's a little bit of time, but... It gets there and that is the more reason you should be doing this maybe a day ahead so you have time to concentrate on other things you want to place your flatware in the order that they will be used with the ones you use first going on the outer part of your plate so my knife definitely to my right you want to place it inwards and then the cutting part facing your place setting I'm going to have my spoons so there will be dessert so the dessert spoon and then the tablespoon your dinner fork and your dessert fork will go on your left and here again the knife you want the cutting part in what's like I said 
You don't need a teaspoon if you're not going to serve anything that requires uh, a teaspoon as well as a tablespoon. We'll have soup and we'll probably have some form of a pudding or custard. So I have my dessert spoon as well. And that is it. You want to follow this because if you are doing it, you want to make sure that you are following the right protocol. This is just basic and you want to do it and do it the right way. For your glasses, you want to place them. If you are going to have your water glasses, that will go right above the knife. I'm not setting with my water glass, so I'm just using my wine glasses. I have my red wine first, that's the little bit of a wider, bigger one. And then my white wine glass, I'm going to place it outwards. So it's totally up to you. I think people will just be drinking water and they'll bring their water glasses to the table with them. So I'm not going to set that there. I'm just trying to make more room. So now that I've decided this is how I'm going to have my napkins, I'll place my placeholders here like that. Add my name card, something simple, but gives it a little bit of a personalized feel. And then I'll set out my lights. I like the warmth and coziness that lights brings to the table. So I'm going to have tea lights as usual. This year I'm using these Hurricane tea light holders and I'm just going to place a tea light in each one of them and when it's lit it's just beautiful and just brings a lot of warmth and coziness and a little bit of vibe and a touch of elegance and elegance is what we are really trying to achieve anyway <laughs> For my floral arrangement, which is going to be the actual centerpiece, I'm going to be using this soup terrain. This is from Martha Stewart. I've had it for six years. You won't find this one on the market these days. It is uh, just so beautiful, elegant with the gold touch. But I'm going to try and find similar ones in length for you. So I filled it with some water and I have my flowers ready. I got these from Sam's Club two days before. So I just started in a bucket of water just to keep it fresh for when I'm making this video. and. I got the extra greens because greens make your flowers just voluminous. It just makes it pop somewhere. And I wanted to have this wide, you know, it's a long table and this is going to be the only floral arrangement. So I wanted it to fan out as much as possible. So I'm trying to measure my stems, make sure that I get a decent length of it. So I put a few in my vase just to make sure, my soup terrain, just to make sure that the length was right. And I'm using that to go ahead and cut everything. So your flowers normally come with your flower food. So I want my flowers to stay as fresh as possible. So I'm going to put two here. I actually used one previously whilst the flowers sat for the two days. So two in here, mix it up, and then I'm going to start arranging my flowers. Just starting with some of my greens for the base, and then we'll continue. I have an obsession for eucalyptus stems, so I'm trying to make sure that I put as many of them in here as possible. <laughs> I think they just make everything more beautiful. So with this arrangement, as you can see, I'm just trying to go around, trying to make sure that every part of my vase is just looking beautifully arranged. This is going to be a centerpiece. Remember, we are going to have people sitting all around the table, so this is not like a regular uh, floral arrangement that you're probably just going to set it behind the wall so you just want to focus on the front part and the sides. Every part of this arrangement has to look beautiful. So yeah, you may want to make sure that once you're done, you still, you know, just stand away from it all, at all angles. Make sure that it is really how you want it. It takes a while. Don't be fooled with how, you know, uh, home influencers just arrange uh, stuff on Instagram. It looks like it was just straight up within seconds. It's done. No, a lot of work goes into it, making sure that it's looking the part, you know, for you to really think that this is a statement piece. And that is what we're trying to achieve. So, yeah, I think we're getting there. I'm just trying to move stuff around a little bit, making sure that I have a perfect balance of all the different kinds of flowers and make this just as beautiful as I possibly can. We are not professionals, but we can only try. 
Floral arrangements on holidays like this are just ridiculously priced. So if you can do this at home and also use a vase that you truly love, I think it's just a win-win situation. And look at how this transforms the general outlook of this table. A real touch of elegance. I just love this. Not having all the components of your tablescape to be of the same height just makes everything even more beautiful. So I'm going to be adding some tippet candles. So these are my candlesticks and they go from tall to short on either side of the vase. That way you're not just looking at everything at eye level, but you have a little bit of depth and height to everything. And I'm going to place these um, velvet pumpkins that I found in TJ Maxx, I think, here. Very inexpensive. I think it was $5 each. I had it styled around my house and I thought they would be nice on the table. So I'm going to put my candlesticks in here. I got this paste that helps your candlestick to stick and stay in the holder because sometimes if it's not very well fitted, it can fall over. It can make it wobbly a little bit and then your candle will drop drip so this way i'm going to make sure that my candlesticks are just stuck here and they're not moving or going anywhere I hope you notice how this just transforms everything it makes everything not just at one level at all angles of the table this is just beautiful this way I'm going to place in the rest of my place cards and our table will be set this is actually the adult table I always create a table for the kids right across from us so I do that the night before Thanksgiving and they just sit right across from us so we are all interacting with the kids but it's just going to block the hallway if I do it way ahead of time I also want to add that most of the stuff I have here, I've had them for years. Doing this is something that I really love, so I'm very intentional about it. I get most of my stuff on clearance at the end of every holiday. In order for your candles not to drip when you light them, you want to trim the wick to be as short as you possibly can. So that is what I'm doing. I don't even think I trimmed the very first one enough. That way it's not going to drip and also it helps it not to be uh, emitting a lot of smoke. These pine cones were in my artificial flower arrangements that I had on the table before I did this and I thought they were going to add a little bit more of elegance so I put them in here and I like it. So I'm going to give you a feel of the vibe I'm trying to achieve with these candles. We're going to light everything so you know how it's going to be on that day. The tall candles will be lit, but I'm going to just blow them out after we get seated and we're just going to have our little individual candles going on with dim lights if possible. Well, I hope this is useful to you this Thanksgiving and beyond. Whenever in the nearest future you are going to be hosting family and friends, I hope this is a nice resource that you can follow. on. I also have a lot of tried and tested recipes from previous hostings that I know will be perfect for your gathering. So I hope you continue watching so you are able to see these recipes and hopefully give them a try for this holiday period. Everybody's going to enjoy these meals. I can almost guarantee that. Just know that when I count my blessings, I count each one of you as well. I thank you for your subscriptions, for your views, for your likes and your shares, and for trying my recipes and coming back to me with feedback that just makes my heart so warm. It is an honor to be able to impact your life and your families. And I most certainly do not take that for granted. I am thankful for the opportunity to do what I love and share it with all of you. I hope you and your family and friends have an amazing Thanksgiving. I hope that at the table you are all able to find reasons to be thankful. 
and if for some reason this year hasn't been the greatest i hope next year you have lots of reasons to be thankful and until i come your way next time with something delicious be loving be kind be happy I always thought I had my turkey game right until last year when I brined it for the very first time. Talk about absolute deliciousness. It was so good. Every piece of that turkey was well seasoned to the bone and we all enjoyed it. Today I'm sharing with you my very simple turkey brine recipe and I hope it is useful for you for this holiday period. Come along and let's do this. I'll start making my brine with one gallon of water, four quarts equals one gallon. I'm going to pour it here into my pot. To this, I'm going to add a cup of coarse kosher salt. I'm going to add some garlic. I'm also going to add some ginger. Some chili flakes. I'm also going to add my peppercorns. I'm going to add four bay leaves in here. And now I'm just going to stir this. You just want to stir until everything is all mixed up. More like until your salt is dissolved. I'm going to take this to the stove top to cook. Just bring it to a boil. Bringing my water to a boil is going to allow all these aromatics to infuse into it. Just look at the color right now, beautiful. It is about to start boiling and as soon as it starts boiling, I'm going to turn off the flame, allow this to cool down before we continue with the next process. I give this 30 minutes to sit and rest. It has cooled off a little bit, not all the way through. I'm going to transfer it into a bigger pot. This is the pot I'm going to actually brine my turkey in. To that, I'm going to add some ice. Actually, I'm trying to add equal amounts of ice. I don't have enough ice in my fridge, so I'm going to add more cold water here. So straight from my fridge, I'm going to add some cold water. So all we are trying to do is come up with two gallons of cold water, ice cold water preferably. You don't want anything that is warmer than room temperature because you're going to end up probably cooking your turkey. So here's my turkey. I have washed it, removed the giblets and everything. I'm going to let it immerse or submerge here right now. Just like this and to that I'm going to add one lemon that I've sliced more infusion even when it sits in the fridge is what I'm trying to do I have some rosemary I'm also going to add some thyme and sage perfect poultry seasoning this is all going to just infuse in the water I'm going to cover this and put in the refrigerator for 24 hours it is very advisable that you do this process in the fridge and not on your countertop because that could lead to food poisoning. And when you are going to be serving other people with that, especially you don't want to do that. You are going to be amazed at how good your turkey is going to turn out to be. It's going to be very moist, very juicy and good to the very bone. Everybody's going to notice the difference. In my next video, I'm going to show you how I achieved this. Your turkey is always the focus of the Thanksgiving meal. And as such, it must come out perfect in taste and in looks. This recipe is going to assure you just that. I hope you give it a try. I know you and your guests are just going to be amazed with how good this will turn out to be. Our turkey has been brining for about 24 hours at this point, And now I'm going to prepare the marinade. So let's do it. So I have here some sage, some rosemary, thyme, two lemons, some ginger, and some garlic. I'll also be adding some onion powder and some black pepper. I'm going to start off by chopping my ginger, which will make it easier for the food processor to get through it. I don't want too many strings of ginger in the marinade. So I'm going to put my ginger here in the food processor. Add my garlic. This is one whole bulb of garlic. Just going to Take the leaves of my sage, just to set the leaves, throw away the stalk. And I'll do the same with my rosemary. This is going to assure you that this turkey that you're going to make comes out just very well seasoned, 
huge on flavor and because of course it is brined turkey is going to come out perfect very juicy so I'm going to do the same with my thyme try is hard but try as much as possible to leave out the, the branches trying to get it this way is not the right way you don't really get anything so going downwards it's like you're going in the opposite direction of how the leaves are going so that makes it easier I'm also going to zest my lemon right in here this is just going to give you so much fragrance don't fear that this is going to make your turkey better it's really not it's just the zest of two just be careful you don't get too much of the white part if anything if there's going to be any bitterness that is where the bitterness will come from anyway but the zest itself is just full of flavor just cut it up and I'm going to juice it right here and add my onion powder my pepper I'm going to use my food processor to crush this I like to use the food processor because I want every part of my herbs to be seen this is garlic herb butter marinade and I want it to show on my turkey I'm going to melt about two tablespoons of butter this is actually salted you can use salted or unsalted and adjust your salt accordingly we have to remember that the turkey we are going to be marinating has been brined so it is perfectly salted anyway you just want that little bit of salt on your ingredients that go in the marinade so I'm done blending everything I'm going to transfer it here into my butter that I've just melted mix everything up and we'll be ready to apply on our turkey I'm also going to add some salt just a little under one teaspoon of salt like I said your turkey has already been brined you don't need too much salt in this marinade now tell me this is not screaming flavor this is just going to be so good on your turkey you will be amazed and so will everybody you know how they go like you said you put what huh what did you put again yeah you're gonna be answering a lot of that on Thanksgiving Day trust me so I've set all that buttery goodness aside and I'm focusing on my vegetables which are going to go into the cavity of my bird so I have one celery stalk two medium-sized carrots and I also have an onion these I'm just gonna cut all up and then I'm going to stuff my turkey right away even though this marinade is going to sit on my turkey overnight but I also want to say you can just go ahead and bake your turkey as soon as you apply the marinade that is if you previously brined your turkey in my previous video I showed you how I did that and I'm going to link it up here for you as well so I brought my turkey out of the fridge I'm going to just quickly give it a quick rinse pat it and then we are going to start applying the marinade on it To ensure that the marinade actually gets to every part of the bird, especially the actual meat, I'm going to lift the skin just like I'm trying to do. Please be careful if you are going to do that. You don't want to rip the skin of your turkey. Remember, this breast part actually is the presentation part of your turkey. So you want to be very gentle. Preferably use one or two fingers and work your way up until you get everything lifted up. And I'm also going to do that on this opposite side which is the neck part as well I like to leave most of the skin on the neck part on and that allows you to just tuck it so that your whole bird is covered on that side and then of course once you serve it you can choose to trim it off but it is perfect this way it makes your turkey look beautiful I'm going to start applying my marinade I like to go under the skin rub it work it all the way to the other end of the chest just like that I mean the breast <laughs> and 
you just want to make sure that every part of your turkey is very very well covered with this marinade which i'm going to be doing now so into the cavity as well yeah slaughter some there because you want this to be good everywhere every piece of that turkey has to come out absolutely delicious Now that I'm done applying my marinade, I'm going to insert my vegetables into the cavity. So I have one onion in here already. I'm going to also add my carrots and my celery. These are going to bring more flavor to your turkey. The onion and celery will bring some aroma and that carrot is also going to bring a little bit more flavor in here. Together, everything is just going to work out for the better of your turkey when you do this. Now our turkey is perfect ready to go in the fridge to marinate overnight so the next day when you're ready to bake it it's pretty simple you just turn on your oven and you bake it i like to let it rest breast side down that way it's going to absorb more of all that juices because whatever juice is going to render is going to fall on the bottom of your bowl so if the breast part which is the thickest part of your turkey is down it's going to soak up some more I'm just getting the rest of everything, the marinade in the bowl, spread it around and I'm going to just wrap my turkey with cling film and put it in the fridge overnight. The next day I brought the turkey out of the fridge. I'm going to let this sit for a while just so it comes a little bit close to room temperature before we bake it. In the meantime, I'm going to start preparing my roasting pan. To get our roasting pan ready, I'm going to chop some celery. I'm also going to add some carrots. One onion. I'm using a red onion, but you can definitely use whatever you have. And I'm going to add some sage, thyme, and rosemary as well. So I'm going to transfer everything into my roasting pan. I'm going to set this on, just like so. I'm going to transfer my turkey into the roasting pan. You want it to have the breast side up, just like this. And the wings, if you can, you're going to tuck it. So it doesn't burn. Okay, wings are behind it, so it's not gonna burn. You wanna make sure to tuck this like this inward. I don't like to cut it. You, of course, you can cut it after your meat is cooked, but it make, makes your meat very well covered. So for this bird, they just tucked it here, which is a very nice way. I've never seen that done before, so. They have the legs crossed over and tucked right in here, and it stayed put. I like to tie it this way because then it covers a little bit of what is in here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do what I'm used to and tie it. I pre-cut my twine because I don't want to make it all dirty, so you have to think ahead. I have some biggest twine here. And using that, I'm going to just tie a knot, pretty much like this, and cut. 
So I have a lot of the butter and marinade in my bowl as well as some liquid that drained from the turkey. I'm just going to lift the marinade and the butter and place on my turkey. So pretty much like this, just pile it on there. It's going to cook and melt and everything is just going to spread around. Remember it has a lot of butter in here. So the rule of thumb for cooking your turkey to perfection is for every one pound, you are going to cook it for 13 minutes. This is actually a 13 pound turkey right here. And so that makes it 13 times 13. And for that, we are going to cook this in here for approximately three hours if you do the math. So into the oven we go. I'm going to bake my turkey undisturbed for the first hour and a half. To my pot, I'm going to add a cup and a half of free range chicken broth, some thyme and sage, and some butter. This I'm going to just let the butter cook in here, dissolve the herbs in there, also just get a chance to boil so it gives off its fragrance and flavors. And I'm going to turn down the heat and let this cool down. And this is what I'm going to use to temper my turkey. That is, I'm going to use that to prevent my turkey from drying out the skin actually of the turkey because moisture inside the bird is assured by brining it. But you want it to stay beautiful and not overcook on the outside so it ends up burning or not looking so desirable. I want to have a very golden, beautiful turkey on the table. So I've let this cool for a while. My turkey has at this point cooked for the first hour and a half or baked, I should say, and I'm going to start tempering it. So I'm using my syringe. This is just my basting syringe and I'm applying some of my broth that is infused with the herbs and has all that butter on it. The butter here is going to clink hopefully to the skin of your bird and it's going to give you that beautiful glass that you want. So I'm going to be doing this every like half hour. I'm going to open my oven and apply a little bit of moisture. That way it is going to reduce the outside temperature of the turkey and help it to cook gradually to come out looking beautiful. A turkey has cooked for two hours at this point. It is looking gorgeous. It's really getting there. I'm just going to rotate my roasting pan. That way you have an even distribution of heat. You want both sides of your turkey to look as much as possible the same. So rotating the pan helps in that regard. I'm going to continue to ensure that my turkey stays moist on the outside so it cooks beautifully by applying more of my broth. Making sure that every part, especially or every part that is upward and hidden, being hit by the heat directly, I'm going to try to apply some. So especially the wings, do well to apply a lot of moisture to it. You want it to come out juicy and perfect because you know those kids always want that turkey wing, okay? <laughs> it has to be perfect for them. So I'm going to actually tent my turkey at this point as well. So I'm going to allow it to cook for the next hour covered with foil because you see it is getting golden. I don't want it to end up being burnt. So I'm going to just put the foil on it, push it back in here and let it cook for the next hour covered. So it's been another hour. So technically three hours into cooking my turkey, it is looking beautiful, glossy. I'm just going to let it cook for an extra 20 minutes uncovered so it is going to come out perfect and here it is at this point thanksgiving turkey in all its glory if it could talk it would be telling you and everybody else looking at it i know i'm pretty i'm pretty just watch me look at me and i was made with lots and lots of love i'm going to allow this to rest i'm going to actually lift the rack from my pan set it aside because I need those pen drippings to make my gravy. I'm going to cover this. You want to cover with foil so that it maintains some heat and also moisture. My pen drippings I'm going to use to make some absolutely delicious gravy and that is coming up next. Now of course you want to garnish your bird because it is the center of attention and bring it to the table. And just like that, you can give yourself a round of applause because you're going to be named the hostess with the mostest. Everybody's going to enjoy it. So now that everybody has admired a turkey, everybody obviously is ready to get a piece of it. And now that you've received all the accolades for looks, let's see what you get for taste. And here we are. Look at how beautiful your turkey is. 
juicy juicy you see all those juices spreading out absolutely delicious well thanks so much for watching it will be such an honor for you to try this recipe some people look forward to an absolutely delicious turkey others just look forward to perfect homemade gravy that they will just pour on almost everything so you've made your delicious turkey you have gorgeous very flavorful drippings left why don't you make homemade gravy it is simply the best and very quick to make this is my pan drippings and if you want to make gravy this is per perfect for the gravy and that's what I'm going to use it for you can also just train it and save it and use it as your broth or your stock your turkey on Thanksgiving Day is just going to be absolutely delicious. Way better with that homemade gravy than store-bought. Store-bought is very convenient, but trust me, making homemade gravy pretty much takes about five minutes and you're done. It smells so good. You can only imagine what this is going to bring to your gravy. This you can just put in your stew or just discard. It's totally up to you. So I have two cups of broth here and that is what I'm going to use to make my gravy. I'm just going to thin it out with just a cup of water, just so it's not too concentrated. And also to make sure there's enough gravy for everyone. I'm going to melt three tablespoons of butter in a preheated pot. Now that my butter is all dissolved, I'm going to add three tablespoons of flour. This is all purpose flour right in here. Quickly stir. And now I'm going to gradually add in my broth. So pretty much this is all it takes with your gravy. You're just going to let this slowly come to thicken up a little bit when it starts boiling. And you know your gravy is ready. Very simple but mm, absolutely delicious. And there you have it. Gravy that is very light. Very, very little flour in there. So a lot of people are going to approve of this. And of course the flavor is huge. Store-bought gravy is not going to cut it. Using homemade broth is just perfect. Store-bought broth may be good, but it's just not going to have that much flavor. Just transfer it into your gravy boats and bring it to the table. Let everybody just slather it on everything. I really hope you try this or you try the next gravy recipe, which is a thicker version. This is a lighter, more healthy option. Both are winners, but the choice is entirely up to you. So this is my thick gravy recipe, very crowd pleasing. It is an absolute winner. And just like the previous one, I'm going to be using my pan drippings. This way you are going to continue the flavor of your turkey into your gravy. So here's my pan drippings. I'm just gonna go ahead and strain it. So once I'm done straining this, I'm going to go ahead and melt some butter. And this is just a tablespoon of butter. And once it's melted, I am going to add a third cup of flour. This is just regular flour. I'm actually using all-purpose flour. And I'm just going to stir this flour for about a full minute, letting it toast a little bit more. And as you can see, it has absorbed all the butter i use very little butter being mindful of the fact that the stock has a lot of the fat from the turkey so it's going to be greasy anyway you just don't want to put too much butter in here for that reason my flour has toasted or fried a little bit in the butter it is almost golden it is a perfect time for me to start adding my broth so i'm going to be adding it gradually your aim is to avoid lumps but then sometimes it's just not preventable you just cannot help it so in this case i'm going to let my gravy cook all the way through and once it is cooked i'm going to go ahead and strain it 
to get rid of the lumps and it's going to turn out perfect so i'm going to go ahead and stir whilst gradually adding in my buff until everything is added in here and then i'm going to let it simmer on low heat for about 10 minutes until my gravy is cooked if you've never made your homemade gravy from scratch i know your inclination is most likely going to be to get a store bought one it is faster more convenient but trust me making your gravy at home is so simple especially if you've cooked that turkey and you have the drippings why not just use it so you know that your flavor fragrance everything is assured this is so good everybody's going to know the difference and you're going to be super proud of yourself so my gravy has simmered for about 10 minutes it is perfectly cooked it smells divine divine everybody's going to love this i am going to just go ahead and strain it to eliminate the lumps in here look at how velvety it is coming out of the strainer everybody's going to love this and was it too much work? Absolutely not. Was it quick to make? Oh yes. And is it delicious? You bet it is. Everybody's going to love this and you are going to be so, so proud of yourself. I'm going to transfer this into my gravy boat and it is ready to go to the table. Some people eat their turkey with their gravy and others, of course, eat their gravy with their turkey. So you really want it to be worth their while, okay? Thanks so much for watching. Do give this a try. I know you are going to love it. A very festive green bean amodine recipe is coming up next. This green bean recipe is quite atypical of your holiday green beans. It has lots of texture, it has pops of color, it is just beautiful to the eyes and amazingly wowing to your taste buds. You are going to love it. It's going to pair so beautifully with everything on your Thanksgiving table everybody's going to be delighted with this for this recipe i'm going to be using some sliced almonds some dried cranberries butter garlic and half of a bread onion i'm also definitely going to be using some green beans i'm going to start off by slicing my half of an onion i'm going to make it into dices actually i'm also going to just go ahead and slice my garlic we love garlic, so we don't mind having big bites of it in here. Considering who is having it, you may choose to mince it as well, so it's easier for everybody else. But for us, this is okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and trim my green beans. Sometimes when you're hard pressed for time, it is almost your best option is to just buy the pre-washed trimmed green beans from the store. But if you agree with me, sometimes you still have to go through it and continue cleaning them because they leave some of them absolutely untouched so i just feel like it's better for me to do this by it which is not trimmed it saves me money and i just have to do it ahead of time sometimes so i have my water boiling now i'm going to just cook my green beans in here i'm actually not really cooking it all the way through this is just pre-cooking it i'm actually going to saute this so just for about a brief two minutes in the hot water which was boiling and now i'm going to transfer it over ice this is process which we call blanching i'm just trying to let it cool right away because if i just strain it and set it there to cool off in in its hot uh, state it's still going to continue the cooking process so having it in the ice is going to shock it right into coolness and it's going to ensure that your green beans maintain their beautiful beautiful color i could have also put a little bit of baking soda in my boiling water before i cook the beans so that the color is popping well now the beans has cooled off i'm going to start making my saute so i have some butter in here butter makes everything better and you know for the holidays it's a lot of butter on the table <laughs> so i've melted my butter i've actually made it to be brown butter the flavor is intense that way i've added my almonds now i'm going to let it toast it's going to get fragrant the butter itself smelling amazing and the almonds in here are going to even just get even more fragrant and absolutely crunchy and delicious this way i've allowed my almonds to toast for a full minute now i'm adding my sliced garlic in here and i'm going to let it also just quickly saute here for about 30 seconds and then i'm going to add my onions in here as well the onions come in here i'm going to stir this and let it toast for about two minutes so everything gets to cook beautifully it smells amazing in here already and i can just imagine how this is going to taste the crunchiness of the nuts in here the nutty flavor that it brings in here 
absolutely delicious well I'm seasoning as I go so I've added some salt in here I'm also going to be adding a little bit of black pepper I'm going to stir this and allow it to cook for a while and once I feel like my onion is cooked enough it begins to get a little bit glossy or sweaty I'm going to go ahead and add in here my craisins or dried cranberries this brings uh, a little bit of sweetness it has a little bit of tang to it it just makes your green beans a lot more interesting nothing so boring like your typical green bean casserole or green bean at the Thanksgiving table or Christmas table this actually looks festive you see that pop of color or burgundy in here it just makes everything just beautiful and absolutely festive if you ask me I'm going to now add in my green beans which is all the way cooked in here and at this point I'm just going to quickly toss it so everything is combined and your green bean amundine is done absolutely simple you have to remember that your beans is actually cooked it is pre-cooked you don't want it to be overcooked you want it to remain crunchy you want it to maintain its beautiful green color so you're just tossing it in here so that it actually picks up some of the flavors from the onions garlic the nuts and the cranberries that is all you're trying to do and of course get warm again so once that is done you're just going to go ahead and transfer this into your serving dish and bring it to the table this is crowd pleasing absolutely delicious everybody's going to love this and your thanksgiving table is going to be interesting everybody's going to be looking forward to your next thanksgiving meal and maybe not just the next one but every single one as well Thanks so much for watching. I hope you try this. You will really, really be happy with it. Stuffing is that one side dish that I look forward to for Thanksgiving. Everything else I pretty much may have had it sometime during the year, but I wait till Thanksgiving for stuffing. This recipe is simple, absolutely delicious, and I know you will love it. This was requested by a KK family member, Stormy McMahon. Stormy, this is for you. So to start, I'm going to melt some butter, about four tablespoons butter into my pot once it's all melted now I'm going to add one onion one medium sized onion that I've chopped in here I'm now going to add my celery, that's a cup of celery as well, and my diced carrot, which is also one cup. Stir. I'm going to add just a little bit of black pepper, about a quarter teaspoon in here, just to season these veggies, and just a little pinch of salt as well. You have to remember that the stuffing mix that I am using actually, I'm bearing in mind that it has seasoning on it already, so I don't want to overdo the salt and the pepper. You just want to go mild. I also have some pecan halves here. I'm going to add that in here. I also like a little bit of sweetness, so I'm going to add some cranberry here. These are craisins. I like the sweetness it brings to stuffing and also if you don't like to have your cranberry sauce at your table, you can definitely incorporate your cranberry by having it in your stuffing. I like to use this Pepperidge Farm brand for my stuffing. So this is the cube stuffing that I use. It has herb seasoning on it and it's pretty good. That is pretty much all I've been using. And I'm going to put it in here before I even add my broth. I like it this way to toast my bread a little bit. Let it pick up all the flavors of the vegetables and the pecans and everything before I add my broth. I'm going to add two and a half cup of free range chicken broth, pour it all over my bread and my vegetables, then give it a stir. You just want to make sure that you stir until the bread becomes a little bit soft and then I'm going to turn off the flame and I'm going to transfer this into a baking dish.
you really don't need to grease your dish before you transfer your stuffing into it just transfer it directly here and i like to level it up a little bit because if you happen to choose to take this to the table you want it to be very well presented so i'm just going to level it up a little bit and then i'm going to bake it in my oven which i've preheated to 350 degrees fahrenheit for 35 minutes <laughs> I prefer my stuffing to have a little bit of moisture. If you are one who likes your stuffing to have a little bit of crisp, then you can just go ahead and bake it without covering it. When I cover it, I get to have it soft, but the edges still get to be a little bit crisp. So whoever wants some crisp can have that as well. So it is a win-win situation for me and everybody else that I'm going to serve this to. I'm going to cover with aluminum foil. So pretty much this is your first step if you are trying to make this ahead. You could just make it like this, put it in the fridge, and then the next day you bake it so you are not late for Thanksgiving. But I'm going to be baking this today, so it's going in the oven. 35 minutes later, this is what we have. Absolutely perfect. It smells amazing, and uh, I just can't wait to dig in. You can see the edges have that crisp that I was talking about, so everybody gets to have what they want. And today I'm just going to go ahead and transfer this into another baking dish that goes with everything else and serve. This absolutely delicious. You have a little bit of sweet, a little bit of crunch and everything in here is just so good. I hope you are able to give this a try. I know your guests will love it. Thanks for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up and share. And until I come your way next time with something delicious, be loving, be kind, be happy. Well, hello there welcome once more to crunch west kitchen and if this is your first time stopping by i'd like to say a very warm welcome to you let's make the best leg of lamb you ever have this holiday season juicy flavor packed you and everybody at that table are just going to be in love with this come along and let's do some cooking in a bowl i'm going to combine some all pepper seasoning paprika and some black pepper to this I'm going to add some garlic I'm pretty much using a whole bulb of garlic and I'm using my garlic press to squeeze it out feel free to reduce the amount if you don't like too much garlic For added flavor and a kick of heat, I'm also going to grate in here about 4 teaspoons of ginger. I'm also going to add some rosemary and sage. So I have two tiny sprigs of rosemary and one sprig of sage. I'm just pulling off the leaves actually. And I'm going to finely mince these and add to my other ingredients. This is going to bring a lot of flavor. For my aromatics, I'm going to add some salt as well as some oil. I'm actually using avocado oil, about two tablespoons of that. I'm going to mix everything. This is going to give me a beautiful, gorgeous paste, which is the marinade for my lamb. I know this is already screaming flavor. You can only imagine what it's going to do to your meat. I'm going to set this aside and I'm also going to chop some vegetables. I have here some celery. I'm just going to roughly cut them as well as some carrots, onions, and uh, garlic. These are going to go on the bottom of my baking sheet. It is going to add some flavor to my meat. I'm going to also use the stock that I'm going to get from this, all the drippings that will come from my lamb. Everything is gonna be used to make uh, some gravy, which will go for the lamb. If that is if you want gravy to serve with your meat. I'm going to transfer these vegetables into my roasting pan. To that, I'm going to add some salt. 
I'm also going to drizzle some olive oil on these and then I'm going to add some pepper as well. This is going to be used in making the gravy. So you want your vegetables to be well seasoned. So the juices that come out of it, it's going to be perfect. I'm going to toss everything together and then set it aside and work on my meats now. I have my leg of lamb here. This is going to be a boneless one. I typically like the bone in because it's beautiful presentation wise, but the boneless is easier for you to work with. You can tuck all your amazing herbs and marinate into the pockets, you know, because it has all that hole inside and makes your meat flavorful. It's easier to slice when it is done cooking. It is already washed. I've patted dry and now I'm making this incision on it. I'm just cutting through the fat. You just want to be able to apply some of your uh, marinate into these uh, openings that you are making and when it cooks and it splits open it is also beautiful it just gives your lamb a beautiful presentation so I'm just trying to make these I'm cutting across almost like I'm making squares and done now I'm going to now go ahead flip it over and apply my marinade to it So most importantly, I'm going to tuck some of this gorgeousness into the opening, you know, the middle part. And that way your meat is not going to just have that flavor on the outside, but every piece of it is going to come out tasting amazing when it is done cooking. So you want to rub it in, massage it, make sure that every part of your meat is pretty much well covered with all this goodness. Now I'm going to use some baker's twine to tie my meat. Remember this is boneless so it has no form or structure. You using your baker's twine to tie it is going to help you to tuck part of the edges that are just sticking out and flying all over inside. So your meat becomes a beautiful well packaged piece that looks almost like how it would have been if it was boning. It is also just beautiful for presentation. Sometimes the lines that the strengths make also makes a beautiful lines and indentations on it when your meat is cooked. So when you cut off the strings, you have beautifully made piece of meat. So I'm just going to tie in ways that I feel like is going to help my meat come together. Whichever way you choose to tie it is totally up to you. You're just trying to make sure that it is one beautiful piece of meat instead of all the rough edges of it sticking out. Once your meat is beautifully tied up, you want to transfer it onto your roasting rack. Then just set it on top of your vegetables that is on the roasting pan. And then bake it. At this point, my oven is already heated at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And my meat went in for two hours undisturbed. Two hours later, this is what we have. Gorgeous piece of meat. Beautifully cooked. Just look at the color on it and all those herbs just sitting on it. You don't want to cut through it right away. So you want to cover with a foil and let it rest a little bit before you do anything to it. So whilst it's covered, I'm going to prepare my gravy. That is if you want some gravy, I have my beautiful well roasted vegetables here 
oozing with all the juices and flavors I'm going to just add some water to it just to get a lot of liquid this is already very intense so there's really no point using some broth but if you want to use broth instead of water you can go ahead and use some beef broth to to just you know deglaze your pan and get all that juices out and then now that I have all these golden beautiful flavor pack juice I'm just gonna go ahead and strain it I'm using a fine strainer here because we are going to make gravy with it once I derive my juices I'm just going to store my vegetables you don't want to throw these away you can blend them into any sauce that you are making you can actually just throw it into something else that you are making as in a way of vegetables and just eat it it is flavor packed and it's still not overly cooked that you can use it the choices are endless you can actually make some light soup with this as well so I'm going to set that aside and then we focus on the gravy I'm going to melt about two tablespoons of butter in my pot that I'm going to make my gravy in once my butter is melted I'm going to add my flour this is actually another two tablespoons of flour it's just regular all-purpose flour stir until everything is well combined it should look like this I'm just going to let it toast a little bit and then I'm going to just add my stock that is the pan drippings that I strained I'm gradually going to add it in here you want to add about just a cup of that pretty much this much keep mixing until everything is well combined so you don't get some lumps in here and then just let this sit and simmer down it is just going to start bubbling once that happens you know your gravy is ready so yes friends this is how easy it is to make your homemade gravy absolutely delicious just cannot be compared with store-bought one just transfer this into your gravy boat and bring it to the table when everything is ready now our meat has been allowed to rest a little it's, it can go on the table and once you cut through it you're assured that all your juices are not going to run out I'm going to now cut off my strings and get this ready for the table now is this just not screaming festive look at how it is glistering and you're assured that everybody at the table is going to love every piece of this every slice of this meat is gonna be perfect now let's cut into it and see how we made out just look at that and that is when I actually like to have boneless because you can make beautiful slices without having to stress about cutting around the bone this was bursting with flavor I really hope you are able to bring this to your holiday table everybody is going to love it thanks so much for watching kindly give me a thumbs up and share well hello there welcome once more to Crunchwest Kitchen and if this is your first time stopping by, I'd like to say a very warm aqua to you. Dear friends, today I'm sharing with you the recipe for the creamiest and most delicious mashed potatoes you will ever make. So I'll be using some Yukon Gold potatoes. These have a higher starch content. You can use Rosette or Idaho potatoes as well. They all will assure you of a creamy consistency in your mashed potatoes. The red skin, not very much if you are trying to make creamy mashed potatoes. So I'm going to peel these. You can also, of course, leave some unpeeled or everything unpeeled. Just give them a good wash before you make your mashed potatoes. But you always have to bear in mind whom you're serving it to. If I am eating it at home with my family, I really don't mind having the skins of my potatoes on. Especially if it is well washed because it's part of the nutrients anyway. But not everybody will be so uh, well into each potato skin. So just be mindful of whom you're serving it to. So of course, I'm peeling them now because we are assuming this is going to be for a crowd this is just for the holidays so in case you have anybody coming in then this is going to be what you would do most likely so i will peel everything give it a wash and then we'll bring this to a I'm done rinsing off my potatoes I'm going to just transfer it into a pot it already has some cold water in here I like to cook my potatoes with cold water that way 
um, it cooks evenly you don't have it having you know sometimes you cook the potatoes the outer part gets overly cooked it's almost like falling off and then the core or the middle is still a little bit hard using cold water to start the cooking process helps to uh, control this I am also adding some salt to this and then I'll bring it to a boil So this cooked for about 30 minutes and now I've drained the water and I'm now transferring my potatoes into a bowl so I can mash it. So using a potato masher, I am going to mash or crush all my potatoes. It is advisable to do it right away when you get it off the stove because at this point it is pretty hot and it helps you to just easily mash it. And of course you want to serve First of my mashed potatoes, I always add some roasted garlic. This is just a whole bob of garlic washed and then I just put it in the oven, especially when I'm making some meat. So this just cooked on the side of the lamb that I'm going to be sharing the recipe with you next. So you see how I made this, but it's pretty easy. You can even do it on the grill. So this is about six cloves peeled into my mashed potatoes it goes. And now I'm going to start adding my butter to this. I'll be adding about 10 tablespoons of butter so that is equal to one steak plus about two tablespoons extra on the side in total to make this mashed potatoes but I'll be doing it in bits so I have about two tablespoons in here right now I am going to just whisk this with my mixer make sure it is all incorporated in here and then I'll add some more so in bits just so you you can know exactly how much um, butter you need in your mashed potatoes and not overdo it and I'm using salted butter curry gold of course because it is just so rich in flavor so i ended up not using any extra salt in this so i'm going to add some more butter now about this is about almost three tablespoons here now so total of five tablespoons is here already mix it and i'll continue this process until i get my desired texture Now I'm going to go ahead and add some crushed pepper to it. You can use some freshly ground like I'm doing or any black pepper you have. Just a little bit, about a uh, quarter teaspoon is all that I want. I don't want it to be too much. And this is going to be the last of my butter here. Mix it all up. In this bowl in my hand right here is some warmed milk. I'm going to be adding this also in bits because you don't want to pour everything in here and end up with a runny textured uh, mashed potatoes so gradually pour a little in here whisk it make sure that uh, the texture is good and if you feel like you need more you are going to add it in total I ended up using three quarter cup of milk all warmed and it was just perfect of course the more you whisk this the, the nicer the texture gets so I'm whisking this for about a total of five minutes at this point it is done it is so battery so smooth silky the perfect texture for your mashed potatoes this is going to be even great baby food maybe not with the garlic but with everything else and the babies love love this mommies you can try these for the little ones okay just look at this such perfection perfection and this is ready I hope you are able to try this. Thanks for watching. I absolutely love candied yams at the Thanksgiving table and look forward to it all year long. I love the notes of spice, the fragrance that all these spices bring to it, and how creamy, buttery, almost velvety that the yams turn out. I'm going to be using some butter. I have some ground ginger, white and brown sugar. I have some allspice, some ground nutmeg, cinnamon, and of course my yams.
So I'm going to peel my yams. Once I'm done peeling them, I'm going to slice them. I'm going to make them into these circles. I specifically chose um, the size of yams to have beautiful, perfect circles that don't need me to cut through them to make semicircles. I want to arrange them in my dish to be beautiful. I've boiled some water. Now I'm going to add my yams in here to cook. I'm not cooking it all the way through. So once it's partially cooked, I transfer it here into my baking dish. Shake it a little bit to get my yams well arranged. And now I'll set that aside and prepare the candied portion of my candied yam. To make that, I'm going to start off by melting six tablespoons of butter. And once my butter is all the way melted, I'm going to add in my sugar. First, my white sugar. Stir. And once that is all the way mixed in here, I'm also going to add my brown sugar. I'm using half and half of each instead of just using brown sugar because I don't want my candied uh, yams to be too dark. I want it to be brownish but not too dark. So now I'm going to add in the brown sugar as well. Give it a stir until it is all combined and then we'll continue to add in the spice. Now I'm going to add in my ginger powder, allspice, cinnamon, and a little bit of nutmeg. I'm going to stir this and let it cook. It smells amazing in here. And if you're able to make this right after you've cooked your meat, your guests are actually going to walk in here to the smell of this gorgeousness. It almost feels like you're making a potpourri in here. So I'm going to let this up melt all the way and now I'm going to add some water. You want to stir in your water gradually because if you add it all just at once without stirring very well, you are going to have the sugar crystallize and you wouldn't want that. So I'm going to do this gradually until everything is well mixed up in here and you may need to use a whisk to help you do this better. Once your candied mix is all liquidy and a beautiful consistency, you're going to go ahead and pour it over your cooked yams that you have tried your best to make sure that it's already arranged because you're going to carry this to the table as it is. So you want to make sure that the yams are well laid out here. So once it comes out of the oven, you really don't have to do much to it. So I'm going to pour my candied glaze over my cooked yams making sure that I cover especially the top part because you want it to come out looking glossy. I'm going to just shake it a little bit, trying to make sure that the candy gets to every part of my yams here. So when it comes out, it's perfect. I'm going to wipe the sides of my baking dish and I'm going to bake this in my oven, which has been preheated to 360 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 to 50 minutes. Once it comes out, it's going to look like this. Absolute deliciousness. It is super soft. It literally melts in your mouth. It is battery. It has lots of spice to it. It is just absolutely delicious. Very warm. It's just the perfect holiday meal that you want to have. Everybody's going to love this as well. And I really hope you give it a try. Hello there! Welcome once more to Crime Choice Kitchen. And if this is your first time stopping by, I'd like to say a very warm welcome to you. Dear friends, today I'm sharing with you the recipe for this crowd pleasing, decadent, moist carrot cake. This one is a keeper, I tell you. Everybody I have served it to love, love it. I take it to every potluck that I'm invited to, I'm going to be part of. I know you will love it. I hope this is just in time for the holidays and you will make this for you and your loved ones. Come along with me and see how I did this. So the good thing about having homemade carrot cake is you get to have real carrots in there. And I always like to grate my own carrot at home. So we're going to start grating our carrots. Oh, 
Of course, you can use a regular grater to do this. You can even buy grated carrot from the grocery store and use. The most important thing is you're making a homemade carrot cake with real carrots. So I'm going to measure three cups of carrots, the grated carrots. And yes, I always heap up my cup like that. I always figure there's a lot of air pockets in this cup of grated carrots, so I heap it up. The more the better. And that's a lot of grated carrots, but you can use this to make fried rice or you can just save it in the freezer and use it at another time. That's actually what I did. So for my actual Thanksgiving, I'm going to use the rest. So three cups right here. So this recipe calls for four large eggs, which I have here, and I'm just going to crack them up. Now we'll set this aside and focus on getting the dry ingredients ready. In a mixing bowl, combine your flour, baking soda, salt, and cinnamon powder. Mix everything. Then set this aside. So in a large mixing bowl, combine your sugar, vegetable oil then you cream this just about a minute now I'm going to be adding my eggs gradually Gradually add your flour, the dry ingredients. Mix this until everything is very well combined, until you get a beautiful paste. Then you add in your grated carrots. At this point, you can choose to use a spatula to stir or keep on whisking with, like I'm doing. And I'm also going to be adding some pineapple chunks. This is like a three quarter cup of fresh pineapple chunks. It is not really a part of the original recipe. I tried this last year, last Thanksgiving actually, and this was so good. So I'm going to add this. Feel free to omit that if you don't like pineapple and keep everything else at the same measurements. It's going to be perfect. I just added a cup and a half of chopped pecans. And yes, I'm going to list everything here for you in the description box as well. So I'm going to mix until everything is very well combined, just like this. And voila, our butter is done. I'm just going to use this spatula to make sure that I scrape everything. You know, sometimes you have some st sticking in the bottom of your pot looking like a paste, which is not really well combined, having everything in a balance. So I'm trying to make sure everything is very perfect in my bowl before I pour it out. In here, I have my baking pans. These are nine inch round baking pans. I am just spraying them with some baking spray. You could use some butter and dust it with um, some flour like most people would do. I like my cooking spray. And so I'm going to pour my butter in here. You're trying to divide this into three. So make sure you could use a ladle to scoop so you have it balanced or you could weigh it. But I'm just using my eye to gauge. Just look at that going like melting lava. <laughs> I could watch this all day just beautiful actually very therapeutic what do you say tap your baking pans on your countertop like this this will help eliminate all air bubbles so your cake bakes beautifully and at this point my oven is preheated at 350 degrees Fahrenheit and I bake this in it for 40 minutes 40 to 45 minutes depending on how your oven works and 40 minutes later our cake is done just look at that 
Set your pans on a cooling rack and let this rest for about two to five minutes. I only did about two and then you flip it. If you're not too sure that the cake is coming out smoothly, just tap on the bottom of your pan like I did so it doesn't come out, you know, falling apart. And look at that, is that not just gorgeous? So I'm gonna flip everything over and allow these to cool completely before we frost them. All right, now let's focus on the frosting. So I have here my powdered sugar or confectioner's sugar. I'm going to pour it right here into a mixing bowl. I have butter. This is salted butter, Kerrygold, my preferred, of course. It is soft, so room temperature butter. So this is one cup bar. I'm going to cut a half of that. Very soft, as you can see. So we're going to start off by creaming the sugar and the butter. could just as well start with everything all together and it's still gonna be fine I'm going to add in my cream cheese now these are two eight ounces block of Philadelphia cream cheese you can use any cream cheese that you prefer of course and these are softened but not all the way room temperature the butter you want it to be very very soft so I'm gonna cream now the cream cheese butter and sugar So I'm going to be adding in here a teaspoon of pure vanilla extract. Scrape the edges of your bowl just to make sure that all the ones, the parts that are not well mixed up get in the center and you're able to whisk everything so your frosting comes out perfect. You want to end up with your frosting looking something like this, beautiful, pillowy. This is just how you want it to be. So at this point, we are done making our frosting and it's time to put that on our cake. So this is going to be a layer cake. So I'm going to start layering it right here. This is going to be the very first layer. One thing about my cakes, don't expect too much. They're never straight. So I always tell people, don't judge it by the look. Just taste it first. I'm just going to put a big dollop of the cream cheese here. Spread it. This layer is what is going to form a sandwich and also to glue or secure your cakes uh, together. If you like a lot of frosting, you would want to make this a little bit thicker than I have. But for me, this is perfect. So apply that layer. Be mindful that carrot cakes, when, you are, when they are big, can be very crumbly. You know, it has all these nuts, the carrots and everything in there. So be careful when you put your dollop of um, frosting on it so you don't end up making crumbs too many crumbs it's it's very difficult not to make crumbs but just be gentle as you stack them together and now i'm going to apply the very last layer just like that so we're now going to cover our top layer and all the sides of our cake with the rest of the frosting smear it on like this be gentle like I said you don't want to just have too many crumbs coming into the frosting so you try to put a little layer first spread it all over and all over the edges and once that is covered you can go ahead and apply the rest until your cake looks as beautiful as you can make it this is a homemade cake we cannot be like the professionals but we want the cake to taste good and look a little bit decent that is all you want to do I've come to find out that using a turntable while you frost your cake makes it a lot easier than just having it sit on a plate. That is what I used to do, but then it's hard for you to swell your cake to be able to apply the frosting. This is very inexpensive, so if you be making cakes a lot, I am everybody's cake lady, so I thought it was just as well that I get one. And this is way under $15, so 
if that helps you can get one for yourself as well maybe this is going to be such a hit that everybody's going to be asking you to make it over and over again <laughs> Once you're done applying all the frosting onto your cake, it is time for you to smoothen it out to make it look beautiful. Like I said, we're not professional, so try your very possible best and that should be enough for a homemade cake. See, keep on going. We really get in there. So I'm just trying to make sure that I cover as much of the cake as possible. But even looking at it now, I think it is perfect, you know, how you have naked cake. So you could have it with a little bit of the carrot cake showing like that. Make a very thin film if that is what you like. And of course, that, that means you would have had thicker amount of the frosting in between the layers. It's looking good for me now and at this point I am telling myself we are in great shape for the shape we are in. If you are more on the skilled side then go ahead and try to smoothen it out more make it more beautiful. But I think for my standard this is okay. <laughs> and I'm going to put some nuts on it as well so that will help even out stuff a little bit. So I have a cup half a cup actually of um chopped pecans more here you can toast it a little bit i didn't toast it but toasted always makes it even taste better and i'm just going to try to make a circle with that on the surface of my cake and i'll also make a little layer on the bottom when i'm done just to make it look a little bit more you know something like you got from the store i really think this is the face left that the cake needed what do you think and now I'm going to go on the bottom as well and make a nice ring around the edges of our cake. And that will be done. Yes, please put all the love you possibly can put on that cake or in this cake. And let everybody that you serve this know that this really came all the way from your heart. This is probably the most beautiful I've ever had my cake carrot cake decorated seriously the taste is always the same of course that is the thing with baking but this i think i've really done my possible best and if you really agree please give me a thumbs up to cheer me up and at this point our cake is done so now this goes into the fridge and it stayed in the fridge overnight because it was very late when we finished making it and now let's see how we did Homemade has never been this perfect. Just look at this. Just take a look. Are you with me? Are you really with me? Here is the review. Uh-huh. Perfection. And now let's cut another piece for the guy behind the camera, okay? He can't wait to have a slice too. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. How beautiful. I really hope you are able to try this. And now it is time for the verdict. See the carrot, real bits of carrots in here, the pecans, how do you like it? Love it. The pineapple, if you love pineapple, you will love this. You can take out the pineapple for sure, but this is so good. I tell you, this is the recipe you've been waiting for. This is good. Very, very good. I really hope you are able to try this. I know you will love it. Thanks for watching. Kindly like and share this video. And until I come your way next time with something delicious, be loving, be kind, be happy. Delicious. Fruit boards and charcuterie boards, or charcuterie if I should say that right in French, boards are very, very trendy these days and today I'm sharing with you this very simple food board idea. I hope you are able to make this for your next gathering. What a simple but delightful way to present your fruit. Everybody is going to love this. I have here fruits. These are actually fruit that I had for Mother's Day. So this video is long overdue but I'm, I, it's finally here and I'm going to start with my watermelon. I'm trying to cut them up into triangles. You just have to have an idea on what shapes you want for your food and how to arrange them. That is basically what this whole video entails. So I'm making my triangles 
setting everything aside as I cut them and then after everything is cut up we will go ahead and arrange them on our board so I'm making these thinner slices I'm going to be using um, a cookie cutter to get some shapes out of this so I'm going to get some hearts out of these watermelons just like that very very simple these are going to go on top of the fruit when everything is arranged a little bit of detail if you have more time you can definitely cut more of this or probably just make the whole watermelon into hearts depending of course on how big your board or the number of guests you are going to have because by the time i'm done cutting out these few shapes i'm going to have a lot of uh watermelon which is still edible but not presentable i can use it on my board so it's totally up to you you can make uh, a lot of shapes totally everything shapes but probably end up just saving the rest so you and your family can eat it later on on the side definitely not wasting anything so the triangles and a few shapes work perfect for me and of course yes i'm going to eat everything else so i'm going to save all these in a bowl and later on we'll tackle that Once I'm done peeling my pineapple, I'm going to cut it into two, then I will slice each half. You want to make these slices as thin as you can, but of course not too thin. For these portions, considering how many people I was expecting, I think this is perfect. You can make it smaller, you can make it into cubes, it all depends on the kind of arrangement you want to make. Now I'm going to slice my oranges next. I have to say everything has been washed already. I actually washed them with some fruit wash. You can also use some vinegar or salt to wash them. You want to make sure that these are very clean before you cut them. You could also cut your oranges into wedges, but for what I'm trying to achieve, cutting them up into slices like this is perfect. So I just sliced three oranges. I have a lot and if you have more people, you can definitely slice some more on the side and just replace as they get used up. I'm going to cut my cantaloupe next so I'm peeling it first and then just here I decided to cut through the half that I've already peeled so I get to show you how you could have also peeled your cantaloupe or get the skin off without having to peel the whole thing. So I've removed the seeds from this portion now I'm going to slice it and instead of slicing um, just a quarter of the cantaloupe, I'm going to do the whole half. So I've approximated it back and now I'm going to just slice. And when I'm done slicing, I'll just separate them by quarters. So if you don't want to peel a whole cantaloupe before you uh, cut it up, you can also cut them or slice them into segments and then remove the skin. It's easier when the segments are smaller than this. This is a quarter so it's a little bit hard but the skin is easily removed that way and then you can cut through it or just eat it whole. So the other quarter of my cantaloupe I'm going to try to cut out some stars, maybe two stars out of that. And that will also go on top of everything when it's just done. The outer part is the better part for presentation, just like this. I'm going to cut my mango and I'm cutting the two sides, the two parts that are very fleshy, just like this, and leave out the pit. And now I'm going to just cut through like this, just make these slits here, and then across it to form a grid, just like that. And once it's done for presentation, you are going to just flip it over like this. Very simple and easy for you to eat your mango this way. So I'm going to have some sliced kiwi on my board, but I also want to just cut up two to make a nice design to sit on everything when it's done. And to do this, you want to make some um, zigzags on your kiwi. So you using a very sharp knife, I'm using actually a paring knife to do this. It's easier for you to use a paring knife to do this. So you're just making sure that your incisions go deep into it to almost hit the center of your kiwi so that way when you're done making these zigzags, it's easy for it to pull apart. Delicious, yeah, yeah. Mm, delicious. 
I definitely want to have a pop of green on my board so I'm going to peel some of my kiwis slice them up and add it on here so for Mother's Day actually I had some uh, honeydew as well which is also green and it was very very good I just wish I was able to make that board as intended on that day but hey we get to make this for another day I just love that heart in the middle of that kiwi when I sliced it up I also have these clementines that I want to add on here so I'm just going to peel them if you are not expecting too many people or you have a very big board you can just put whole clementines there so they can pick and peel up but peeling it and putting it on the board is also very simple and easy for your guests and I'm just going to make sure that these don't have all these white stringy parts on and then I'm just going to separate them into wedges and just put them on the board when we are done I also had some grape that I was going to put on my board I did forget but I'm just showing you how to just cut them into little clusters so on the board your guests will just pick a cluster and it's easier that way than to have them loose so everything is cut up and ready and now we are going to start arranging so I have my board here this is actually a turntable so it's more like a, a lazy Susan it sprints around so perfect for this purpose and now I'm going to start arranging my stuff we are going to start with the pineapple and I'm trying to arrange them by offsetting them so one in one out which is not even easy for me I am so bad at coordination but of course I know what is beautiful and I'm trying to achieve something that is beautiful if you are somebody who is very crafty very well coordinated this is going to be super easy for you but look at me struggling here so anyway the big parts are going on the board first so my pineapples followed by my watermelon so I'm trying to place these big fruit I would say in on the inner third of my board because I want to leave the edges to place the thinner slice uh, fruit on the edges and I also want to leave the center out so I can put my berries there so my watermelon is here now I've added my cantaloupe now I'm trying to place my fruit on the borders I'm starting with the mangoes and now I'm going to put the berries in the middle so I have my blackberries here and I'm going to try to make a ring so I can put the blueberries in the center of the uh, blackberries just like this <laughs> And now I'm just going to place some more blackberries all around it just to form a nice border. My strawberries, I'm trying to place some here in this little corner. And then I'm also going to try to find more room later for more. Oranges go here just like I said. I'm leaving the other borders so I can place my sliced fruit here. A mango, an orange. And now I'm going to make room for my kiwis as well just like that this board is actually taking shape now it's beginning to look beautiful if I may say so myself so now that I've completely filled my board with fruit I'm just trying to find little spots to fill in my clementine some more strawberries just to make sure that all the little holes that we see are all filled with little stuff just like I'm trying to do now and of course you also don't want to forget the cut out fruit just find good spots to place them so they make your whole board pop so I have a star here and now I'm placing a heart and of course you also don't want to forget about your kiwi when you're done with this place everything in little corners just like this I'm just trying to tuck it in between the yellow so there's a pop of green on that side and here we go very simple to do I hope you consider making this next time when you have a gathering trying to find more space for my strawberries but please try not to make your board too tacky and in the middle of my berries I'm just going to place some mint here just look at the difference this brought in here I hope you try the holidays coming up and if you are going as a guest you can offer to make this and bring it along your hostess is going to be super super thankful thanks so much for watching it is truly an honor to be part of your gatherings and celebrations through the recipes I share with you I wish you and yours a happy holiday period times are hard and maybe our celebrations this year is not going to be as grand but we have life and for that we should be thankful I appreciate your support I appreciate the feedbacks I get from you trying my recipes and coming back to let me know how everything goes just know that my family and I are very thankful 
and from all of us we say happy thanksgiving and happy holidays to you and yours god bless you